Chapter Twenty One of the Mayor of Casterbridge by Thomas Hardy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Perry. Chapter Twenty One. As a maxim glibly repeated from childhood remains practically unmarked till some mature experience enforces it, so did this high place hall now for the first time really show itself to Elizabeth Jane, though her ears had heard its name on a hundred occasions. Her mind dwelt upon nothing else but the stranger and the house and her own chance of living there all the rest of the day. In the afternoon she had occasion to pay a few bills in the town and do a little shopping when she learnt that what was a new discovery to herself had become a common topic about the streets. High Place Hall was undergoing repair, a lady was coming there to live shortly, all the shop people knew it, and had already discounted the chance of her being a customer. Elizabeth Jane could, however, add a capping touch to information so new to her in the bulk. The lady, she said, had arrived that day. When the lamps were lighted and it was yet not so dark as to render chimneys, attics, and roofs invisible, Elizabeth, almost with a lover's feeling, thought she would like to look at the outside of High Place Hall. She went up the street in that direction. The hall, with its grey façade and parapet, was the only residence of its sort so near the centre of the town. It had, in the first place, the characteristics of a country mansion, bird's nests in its chimneys, damp nooks where fungi grew, and irregularities of surface direct from nature's trowel. At night the forms of passengers were patterned by the lamps in black shadows upon the pale walls. This evening motes of straw lay around, and other signs of the premises having been in that lawless condition which accompanies the entry of a new tenant. The house was entirely of stone, and formed an example of dignity without great size. It was not altogether aristocratic, still less consequential, yet the old-fashioned stranger instinctively said, blood built it, and wealth enjoys it however vague his opinions of those accessories might be. Yet as regards the enjoying it, the stranger would have been wrong, for until this very evening when the new lady had arrived, the house had been empty for a year or two, while before that interval its occupancy had been irregular. The reason of its unpopularity was soon made manifest. Some of its rooms overlooked the market-place, and such a prospect from such a house was not considered desirable or seemly by its would-be occupiers. Elizabeth's eyes sought the upper rooms and saw lights there. The lady had obviously arrived. The impression that this woman of comparatively practised manner had made upon the studious girl's mind was so deep that she enjoyed standing under an opposite archway merely to think that the charming lady was inside the confronting walls, and to wonder what she was doing. Her admiration for the architecture of that front was entirely on account of the inmate it screened. Though for that matter the architecture deserved admiration, or at least study, on its own account. It was Palladian, and like most architecture erected since the Gothic age, was a compilation rather than a design. But its reasonableness made it impressive. It was not rich, but rich enough. A timely consciousness of the ultimate vanity of human architecture, no less than of other human things, had prevented artistic superfluity. Men had still quite recently been going in and out with parcels and packing-cases, rendering the door and hall within like a public thoroughfare. Elizabeth trotted through the open door in the dusk, but becoming alarmed at her own temerity she went quickly out again by another which stood open in the lofty wall of the back court. To her surprise she found herself in one of the little used alleys of the town. Looking round at the door which had given her egress, by the light of the solitary lamp fixed in the alley, she saw that it was arched and old, older even than the house itself. The door was studded, and the keystone of the arch was a mask. Originally the mask had exhibited a comic leer, as could still be discerned, but generations of Casterbridge boys had thrown stones at the mask, aiming at its open mouth 
and the blows thereon had chipped off the lips and jaws as if they had been eaten away by disease the appearance was so ghastly by the weekly lamp glimmer that she could not bear to look at it the first unpleasant feature of her visit the position of the queer old door and the odd presence of the leering mask suggested one thing above all others as appertaining to the mansion's past history intrigue by the alley it had been possible to come unseen from all sorts of quarters in the town the old playhouse the old bull-stake the old cockpit the pool wherein nameless infants had been used to disappear high place hall could boast of its conveniences undoubtedly she turned to come away in the nearest direction homeward which was down the alley but hearing footsteps approaching in that quarter and having no great wish to be found in such a place at such a time she quickly retreated there being no other way out she stood behind a brick pier till the intruder should have gone his ways had she watched she would have been surprised she would have seen that the pedestrian on coming up made straight for the arched doorway that as he paused with his hand upon the latch the lamplight fell upon the face of henchard but elizabeth jane clung so closely to her nook that she discerned nothing of this henchard passed in as ignorant of her presence as she was ignorant of his identity and disappeared in the darkness elizabeth came out a second time into the alley and made the best of her way home henchard's chiding by begetting in her a nervous fear of doing anything definable as unladylike had operated thus curiously in keeping them unknown to each other at a critical moment much might have resulted from recognition at the least a query on either side in one and the self-same form what could he or she possibly be doing there henchard whatever his business at the lady's house reached his own home only a few minutes later than elizabeth jane her plan was to broach the question of leaving his roof this evening the events of the day had urged her to the course but its execution depended upon his mood and she anxiously awaited his manner towards her she found that it had changed he showed no further tendency to be angry he showed something worse absolute indifference had taken the place of irritability and his coldness was such that it encouraged her to departure even more than hot temper could have done father have you any objection to my going away she asked going away no none whatever where are you going she thought it undesirable and unnecessary to say anything at present about her destination to one who took so little interest in her he would know that soon enough i have heard of an opportunity of getting more cultivated and finished and being less idle she answered with hesitation a chance of a place in a household where i can have advantages of study and seeing refined life then make the best of it in heaven's name if you can't get cultivated where you are you don't object object i oh no not at all after a pause he said but you won't have enough money for this lively scheme without help you know if you like i should be willing to make you an allowance so that you not be bound to live upon the starvation wages refined folk are likely to pay ye she thanked him for this offer it had better be done properly he added after a pause a small annuity is what i should like you to have so as to be independent of me and so that i may be independent of you would that please ye certainly then i'll see about it this very day he seemed relieved to get her off his hands by this arrangement and as far as they were concerned the matter was settled she now simply waited to see the lady again the day and the hour came but a drizzling rain fell elizabeth jane having now changed her orbit from one of gay independence to laborious self-help thought the weather good enough for such declined glory as hers if her friend would only face it a matter of doubt 
She went to the boot-room where her patents had hung ever since her apotheosis, took them down, had their mildewed leathers blacked, and put them on as she had done in old times. Thus mounted, and with cloak and umbrella, she went off to the place of appointment, intending, if the lady were not there, to call at the house. One side of the churchyard, the side towards the weather, was sheltered by an ancient thatched mud wall, whose eaves overhung as much as one or two feet. At the back of the wall was a cornyard with its granary and barns, the place wherein she had met Farfrae many months earlier. Under the projection of the thatch she saw a figure. The young lady had come. Her presence so exceptionally substantiated the girl's utmost hopes that she almost feared her good fortune. Fancies find rooms in the strongest minds. Here, in a churchyard old as civilization, in the worst of weathers, was a strange woman of curious fascinations never seen elsewhere. There might be some devilry about her presence. However, Elizabeth went on to the church tower, on whose summit the rope of a flagstaff rattled in the wind, and thus she came to the wall. The lady had such a cheerful aspect in the drizzle that Elizabeth forgot her fancy. Well, said the lady, a little of the whiteness of her teeth appearing with the word through the black fleece that protected her face. Have you decided? Yes, quite, said the other eagerly. Your father is willing? Yes. Then come along. When? Now, as soon as you like. I had a good mind to send to you to come to my house, thinking you might not venture up here in the wind. But as I like getting out of doors, I thought I would come and see first. It was my own thought. That shows we shall agree. Then can you come to-day? My house is so hollow and dismal that I want some living thing there. I think I might be able to, said the girl, reflecting. Voices were borne over to them at that instant on the wind and raindrops from the other side of the wall. There came such words as sacks, quarters, threshing, tailing, next Saturday's market, each sentence being disorganized by the gusts like a face in a cracked mirror. Both the women listened. Who are those? said the lady. One is my father. He rents that yard and barn. The lady seemed to forget the immediate business in listening to the technicalities of the corn trade. At last she said suddenly, Did you tell him where you were going to? No. Oh, how was that? I thought it safer to get away first, as he is so uncertain in his temper. Perhaps you are right. Besides, I have never told you my name. It is Miss Templeman. Are they gone on the other side? No, they have only gone up into the granary. Well, it is getting damp here. I shall expect you to-day, this evening, say, at six. Which way shall I come, ma'am? The front way, round by the gate. There is no other that I have noticed. Elizabeth Jane had been thinking of the door in the alley. Perhaps as you have not mentioned your destination, you may as well keep silent upon it till you are clear off. Who knows but that he may alter his mind? Elizabeth Jane shook her head. On consideration I don't fear it, she said sadly. He has grown quite cold to me. Very well. Six o'clock, then. When they had emerged upon the open road and parted, they found enough to do in holding their bowed umbrellas to the wind. Nevertheless, the lady looked in at the cornyard gates as she passed them, and paused on one foot for a moment. But nothing was visible there save the ricks, and the hump-backed barn cushioned with moss, and the granary rising against the church tower behind, where the smacking of the rope against the flagstaff still went on. Now Henchard had not the slightest suspicion that Elizabeth Jane's movement was to be so prompt. Hence, when, just before six, he reached home and saw a fly at the door from the King's Arms, and his stepdaughter with all her little bags and boxes getting into it, he was taken by surprise. "'But you said I might go, father,' she explained through the carriage window. "'Said? Yes, but I thought you meant next month or next year. Odd sees it, you take time by the forelock. This, then, is how you be going to treat me for all my trouble about ye.' 
oh father how can you speak like that it is unjust of you she said with spirit well well have your own way he replied he entered the house and seeing that all her things had not yet been brought down went up to her room to look on he had never been there since she had occupied it evidences of her care of her endeavours for improvement were visible all around in the form of books sketches maps and little arrangements for tasteful effects henchard had known nothing of these efforts he gazed at them turned suddenly about and came down to the door look here he said in an altered voice he never called her by name now don't he go away from me it may be i've spoken roughly to you but i've been grieved beyond everything by you there's something that caused it by me she said with deep concern what have i done i can't tell you now but if you'll stop and go on living as my daughter i'll tell you all in time but the proposal had come ten minutes too late she was in the fly was already in imagination at the house of the lady whose manner had such charms for her father she said as considerately as she could i think it best for us that i go on now i need not stay long i shall not be far away and if you want me badly i can soon come back again he nodded ever so slightly as a receipt of her decision and no more you are not going far you say what will be your address in case i wish to write to you or am i not to know oh yes certainly it is only in the town high place hall where said henchard his face stilling she repeated the words he neither moved nor spoke and waving her hand to him in utmost friendliness she signified to the flyman to drive up the street End of chapter 21